there's a lot of interest for your talk, Sandra. <laughs> so great, we are going on to our next webinar, which is how to design a green website with Sandra Paller from Microsoft. And Sandra is an uh, organizer of Climate Action Tech, works as a designer at Microsoft in London. She's driving initiatives around digital sustainability at work and is involved in caring for the Climate Action Tech community. In her talk, she will cover the Microsoft Green Design Principles, which she put together with volunteers at Microsoft. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Again, I share my screen get us kicked off um so i kind of did a little thing here where i just did a strike through of website and just called it digital product because i think we can go wider than websites with this talk but yeah hello everybody i'm sandra my pronouns are she her and i am as priya said a co-organizer of the community climate action tech and i work as a designer at microsoft where most recently i've been working with a team of volunteers across the company to define the green design principles for digital product design and I guess before I move into the meat of this topic, um, the reason for why I've started talking about this at all and learning more about it in 2019 was because nobody else was talking about it. Um, I don't remember a single conversation at work in my career in digital design um, up until that point when I started speaking up basically where the impact of digital experiences on the planet was mentioned. And that alone, that lack of conversation and awareness of this kind of motivated me to speak up myself and dive deeper and learn more. And in this talk, I'll hopefully prepare you for your journey in this space, and I'll hand you a getting started backpack, and then I'll walk you through what you can do. And along the way, you'll get lots of recommendations for different paths to go down in your own time as well. It's kind of like a little hike, if you like. <laughs> so. Let's get started with our backpack. This will help you contextualize how climate relates to digital world and tech at large. First, the climate crisis doesn't happen in a vacuum. This has been mentioned throughout um, the Design for Planet Festival today, but basically reiterating, climate change is not solely an environmental issue. It's rooted in a web of ethical, political, and systemic issues. And all of these overlap with tech, design, and how we do business. Um, our society is built on a love for growth, but we're not that great at knowing when to stop. And this has obviously had an impact on the climate, but it's also showing up in the tech industry. So if we think about the build fast and break things mentality, we quickly realize that it might not lead to the best decisions or the best outcomes for individuals, society or the planet. So for more thoughts on systemic climate related issues related to the tech industry, I can highly recommend um, checking out this chat with Joycelyn Longdon, which we put together in the Climate Action Tech community last year. Big change starts small. Um, it only takes 3.5% of the population to participate in nonviolent protests to ensure serious political change. And similarly, in companies and businesses, you can also form groups and push for changes from within. In the beginning, it's important to choose battles that are big enough to matter, but small enough to win. That way you can build a reputation and then go and tackle bigger things. And this line of thinking came up in a book club book that I'm currently reading, Blueprint for Revolution. I've been in this book club for more than two years now, I think, maybe even three. And it's been a fantastic way of learning more about climate and activism and nature together with others. So that's another path for you to explore in your own time, either this book club or a different one. Then talking about climate can be hard. It's not an easy topic, especially because we're all at very different points of understanding of the climate crisis and our kind of relationship to it as well. And we need to be open and listen to one another and share what we know. This also came up in the um, session about working with communities earlier on the main stage. Um, if you listen to that. Um, when it comes to getting others in your team or company leadership on board, it can be useful to figure out where they are at in their journey and what they value and see if you can connect that to the climate crisis. Another fun way to try and dive into this topic that is not necessarily the most fun um, is through play. So 
I joined a workshop a bit over a week ago that did just that with the medium of humble Lego bricks. We kind of tried to find different ways to talk about challenges and opportunities in climate in particular. And then the last thing in your Getting Started backpack is that digital is physical. This might be the most obvious, yet surprisingly hard to grasp concept because digital feels so invisible, right? But your work has a direct impact on the planet because digital services require physical infrastructure from the devices that you use to design for your design work to routers and cables that connect you to servers, to data centers where your website or app is stored, and then to the end user devices as well that interact with your designs. And all of those devices also require electricity to run. And given that in the last year, less than 30% of all energy generated came from renewables, you can get a sense of how electricity needed, the electricity needed to support your design is most likely still created by burning fossil fuels. So yeah, this is a, a big one. Keep that in mind, digital is physical. And if you do want to dive a little bit deeper into this, I can highly recommend Tom Jarrett's work in this space. He's gonna come up in this presentation a few more times. Um, but as part of this event in 2019, he talked about how digital consumption impacts the planet. And it's well worth a watch, especially if this idea is new to you. So now you've got your backpack ready. You know that the climate crisis doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know that big change starts small. You know that talking about climate is hard. And you know that digital is physical. So now it's time to dive into what you can do. This will be split into two categories. And this is kind of the, the green design principles work that we've been kind of building on at Microsoft. The two categories are called think bigger before you start and build better by default. So think bigger before you start offers fundamental questions to ask yourself and your team when you're starting a new project or when you're reevaluating your current project. The current system is not working. It benefits the few and destroys the livelihoods and environments of many. So the first step in thinking bigger is challenging the status quo. What could this look like in your design job? Ask questions. Are we working with clients that don't align with our vision of the future? If so, why? Which cloud providers are we using to store our work? Do they have sustainability goals? Are they running on renewable energy? You can also interrogate the real project purpose. Why are we doing this? And keep on asking that until you get to the core motivation. And you can dig deeper into the impact of the project as well. So not just starting with why you're doing this, but also what impact will it have? Think about short term, medium term and long term. Who is harmed? Who is helped? Are we encouraging consumption or conservation? And then you could also question the metrics for success. Are more clicks really going to give us insight as to how useful this is? Why do we need to grow our user base? These are definitely challenging the status quo and um, good conversation starters, if nothing else, I guess. Um, and once you've challenged the status quo, you may ask yourself, what should we do next? And this is where we have borrowed a principle from, this, um, from the society-centered design principles putting care first. So they talk about this beautifully in the society centered design principles, moving away from delivering solely for individual and commercial interest. It's about considering societal and planetary justice and health as core to our decisions. And in your work, this can encompass looking at the power dynamic within your team or within the wider company who has the power in decision making, who is left out, what is the power dynamic between your team and your end users? What impacts might your project have on non-humans? And then with regards to health, um, we kind of link, well, in this presentation, there's a link to the Spotify ethics assessment, which is a, a great little tool to evaluate physical, emotional, and societal harms that your product might cause. 
So things like addiction, anxiety, accidents due to distraction, exclusion of a group of people, etc. And then for societal and individual mental health, we could also think about moving away from the attention economy. And this is where I'm going to come back to Tom Jarrett's work yet again. This experiment of his for a low energy Instagram shows alt text per default. And the user has to tap on the image to or on the alt text to reveal the image. And this is also a little bit about returning control to the user rather than swamping them with a homogenous feed of content that tries to keep their attention. It's about cutting the noise and providing karma experiences. So thinking bigger and changing those mindsets, not just in ourselves, but in the entire industry <laughs> will take a while. But as designers, we often have the privilege to question things and the skills to reimagine, tell stories and take others on this journey with us. And while we work on this larger mindset shift, we can also take more immediate actions in parallel, which brings me to the second part of what you can do. Build better by default focuses on actions you can take during the design and development process. First, we can ensure that our work is optimized for low energy consumption. We can simplify our user journeys, avoid endless scrolling and auto-loading content. We can remove visuals that we don't need and reduce file sizes for our images and videos. There's also ways to optimize fonts and colors. If you want to dig deeper into some of these UI design actions, check out Tom Greenwood's book, Sustainable Web Design, or the corresponding website, sustainablewebdesign.org. They're great resources to kind of get started and get more actions. One of the examples that is mentioned in the book is this low impact website um, by Organic Basics, where they went for vector graphics rather than photos of models wearing their clothes. This reduced the amount of electricity required to run the website simply because less data has to be loaded and less data has to be stored, which brings me to another point of optimizing, storage and longevity. One small change with a big impact is going, is going for a cloud provider that is running on renewable energy, but this shouldn't be an excuse to store more, quite the contrary. Storing only what you need and managing our digital waste better are crucial methods to keeping digital carbon footprints low. This also goes hand in hand with privacy if we think about user data as well as cloud costs. Because um, if we store smaller things or less stuff, it needs less space. A great thinker in this space is Jerry McGovern. He wrote a book called Worldwide Waste, which I can also highly recommend. We can also, and this is the longevity part of this <laughs> little um, paragraph, um, make sure that our designs work on all the devices because we, reply, we replace devices for many different reasons. But in most cases, it's not because the hardware is broken, but because there's problems in the software. And all of the other tips um, in terms of simplifying the user journeys, uh, removing what you don't need, all of that helps optimize your app or website, and therefore also makes it more likely to function on all the devices as well. So it kind of packages everything up nicely. Secondly, we can be more transparent and use our work to inform and empower users, raising awareness about the impact of digital products and services. We could visualize wasted resources and give users control. So for example, providing options to switch to a different energy consumption mode or giving the user the option to turn off all auto-generated content. Um, the other thing to think about with transparency is building in ways of giving feedback and then responding to that as well. And this kind of leads back into the um, storage point as well of only storing what you need. This is a project by Lu Yi. Um, it's a speculative project on a carbon aware operating system. And it's a great example of being more transparent about the current state of the electricity grid. So the interface gives indicators on whether there's an abundance of renewable energy or not. And her project also applies the next point that's in my list. Um, so she's made sure that the system itself is not just transparent, but also adaptable. 
if our websites and apps are aware of their context and the available resources, they can adapt accordingly. So if a user is in a crisis situation without access to power and they need access to news updates without draining their phone battery instantly, could those news websites remove videos, images, and ads and optimize the content for users with no access to power? Or when you're reading articles online, could the design change depending on how clean the energy is at any given time? This is yet another example of Tom Jarrett's work, <laughs> Branch Magazine. A lot of the articles in there are very much worth a read. It's all about creating a more sustainable internet for all. And that brings me to one last recommendation, and I'm definitely biased with this one. <laughs> the Slack community that I help organize in my spare time, climateaction.tech. It's a great space to learn more and connect with others interested or active in this space of digital sustainability. We've also got a huge public wiki page um, where pretty much all of the resources that I just mentioned are captured as well. Um, and there's lots of links to other um, des more design focused communities as well. So Climate Action Tech is a mix of engineers, um, project managers, designers, everybody kind of coming together who works in tech. Whereas there's also um, more 100% design focused communities like the um, climate designers community or the sustainable UX Slack community as well. But I digress. <laughs> the point is, there is room for us to change things. We can make small changes in our design practice that have ripple effects and impacts. We can use the knowledge from our backpacks to learn and question things and band together. And it is time to change our mindsets and how we view our work and our role in the world. So let's build only what we need better by default optimized, transparent, and adaptable. And let's use our craft and our imagination and our influence to challenge the status quo and design a different future where we can put care first. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was really, really inspiring. Thank you, Sandra. It was really, really inspiring. I've been calling you Sarah, my bad. It's been a long day. Apologies for that. <laughs> no worries. Um, there have been a bunch of questions, especially on the links and the presentation. There's such a you know gold mine of things you found here. What's the best way that people can reach out to you and find out where to go to the Slack channel or the books? Or the is is there somewhere they can go and find all these links? Yeah, so I'll put a link to our Climate Action Tech website into the chat. Um, yeah. This is where you can you can sign up for the community. And then if you don't want to sign up for the community, but you still want to check out the resources, I'll, I'll put a link to the Greener Design um, Wiki page as well, so that you can kind of look at that and then decide on whether or not you want to join. Brilliant, because there's also questions on, you know, how do you calculate the carbon of your websites? I guess those kind of things can be found out more through the Slack yes. channel. Perfect. Totally. Uh, there were some questions here. I'm just going to quickly scan through the Q&A. One question was, which KPI do you use for measuring the, it just says me to measure the sustain. So I don't know what means measure sustainability or measure website carbon, but are there any key KPIs you recommend that people should look up when they are measuring the carbon footprint of their digital products? So in... In all transparency at Microsoft, we're not, or at, at least in the design side of Microsoft, we're not at a point yet where we're actually able to measure everything properly. We are having conversations with engineers and we are um, trying to get to that point where we can measure things properly. Um, and then also kind of make it part of the success metrics. But at the moment, um, we're not quite there yet. There are, however, tools out there, especially if you work on websites, um, there are tools out there to measure and then um, use that as a baseline, for example, and compare yourself to your competitor websites and then try and be lower than them in terms of your um, your carbon footprint. So, yeah, the, there's we're, we're still in the in the early stages of figuring all of this out. Um, so, yeah. 
there are also some questions around the whole cryptocurrency and the change in the current standards as well. And I was wondering whether you had a point of view from, you know, proof of work to proof of um, mm. you know, all those elements which comes with the data centers. And I was wondering where, based upon your discussions with the community, where, what's the current kind of point of view around Bitcoin or any of the crypto changes mm. that you, know, you the community is tracking? I think from my point of view, it very much is a question of application because if we have technology that we just build for technology's sake without really considering what it will do um, or who it will impact and how um, then it's not worth building so it's one of those um, one of those kind of situations where it's super important to interrogate what exactly it will be useful for and whether the the cost of building it outweighs the benefit because sometimes something can cost a lot to build and then only benefit like three people um, and that is probably not worth it so um yeah considering considering that is i think necessary for some of those also, technologies also love your um your take on cloud on the ground and how increasingly when there's digital transformation, there's a couple of uh, folks here also working in government. And when there's digital transformation, there's a big onset of, you know, let's put things on the cloud, but it's not such an easy answer. So I was wondering mm. if there are any recommendations again you have from the putting on your Microsoft um, hat on, whether it's Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, are there any best practices in digital transformation around this? Totally. I'm going to switch that hat right around and, and talk from a climate action tech perspective, because that exact question comes up again and again in our SAC community. And we've got a um, page in our internal wiki as well, where we um, cover some of that, of like what are the greenest cloud providers basically for your need. Um, one of the things, I guess, to, to consider with digital transformation in general, um, and this is kind of going back to a paper I read a while ago where um, the author discussed whether um, commuting to work physically or whether digital commute is more sustainable. And one of the things that the author talked about in that paper was that we shouldn't just look at the time, like the amount of energy required during the commute, but also about the time and that is kind of freed up by the digital commute and what is done in that time. Because ultimately, if we don't drive to work, but instead kind of work from home online, but we end up, I don't know, buying a private jet and flying around the world for every other weekend, then that is gonna be less sustainable um, than commuting to work. So it's like, that's an interesting, um, concept that I try and keep in mind as well like what are we doing with the other time that is free if we do go away from physical and into digital um yeah That's slight tangent there but there you go <laughs> do you also have any real world meetups for people in local like in either in around cities in UK that they can meet up physically as well face to face yeah, so we've got a lot of different local channels in the climate action tech community and through those channels, um, our members sometimes just meet spontaneously or they go to other events together or they organize events um, specifically like climate action tech related events. Um, so yeah, there's there's things going on primarily in London, I would say, um, but we do have yeah lots of local channels so if people are motivated to meet with others they can um, reach out through those channels and then meet brilliant and the last question let me just check uh about sharing the slides i guess there's a way for us uh, for the folks here to get access to your slides either like through the slack channel or through twitter or if you could just suggest yeah, the I best will... way yeah i will try and figure that out um maybe if I'll, I'll send my LinkedIn through yeah, and then um, I'll post it there as well. 
And the final one, which I wanted to just a personal thing is I'm a big fan of the branch magazine and I've been following that for a while. I was wondering, like, this is almost like a futurist manifesto for Marinetti. Like if you think about a new kind of a digital aesthetics for product design, mm. if you think about dynamic island and all those kind of busy bang motion design. And if you think about what you were suggesting here, which is a lot more with care and consciousness versus just using what the rendering engines can do. Do you have yeah. a sense of who's right now thinking about the future of the aesthetics around digital product design with those principles in mind? Oh, there's there's lots of people within climate action tech again. So um, and like Branch Magazine is a great place as well to dive into some of those ideas because, yeah, there's there's lots of interesting ideas. And um, there's one um, climate action tech member who also created a directory of websites that are all um, optimizing as much as possible and kind of trying to show what that can look like in different um, for different industries and yeah different purpose-built websites so lots out there um, yeah Good. so maybe we need a new cool site of the day literally <laughs> <Which is laughs> yeah <laughs> for those of us who remember that yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandra. Apologies for calling you Sarah throughout, but yeah, it's great to kind of hear from you and also like all the people to connect with you. And I'm hoping that folks here can reach out and use some of your resources and continue the conversation on Slack. Thanks for yes. your time. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys.